Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khatib al-Nabiyyin wa imam al-Mursaleen Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Did you guys feel anything? When I said assalamu alaykum, or when the brother said assalamu alaykum earlier like five times, did you feel anything in your heart? Probably not, right? Assalamu alaykum. How do you feel though? I appreciate it. Thank you for the response. But how do you feel? Happy? Happy Muslims? No comment? You feel happy? It's interesting, you know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zumar, in a very powerful surah, and all the surahs in the Quran are powerful in their own unique way. Surah Al-Zumar is a very remarkable surah. And towards the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes what will happen on the Day of Judgment. He says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ طِبْتُمْ فَادْخُلُوهَا خَالِدِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the people of taqwa will be taken to the gates of paradise in groups. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just like a group like this, we're all here, we all will be gathered around the gates of paradise in groups. And when we get to the gates of Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the gates will be opened, the guardians of the gates of paradise will say to the believers what? Salamun alaikum. Peace be upon you. Security, safety, peace, tranquility upon you. Tibtum, you've succeeded. Fadkhuluha khalidin. So enter into paradise to stay here forever. You've, that's it. You've passed the, the ayahs that the brother just recited. Going over the sirat, you've made it through that. You're now at the gates of paradise. Fadkhuluha khalidin. Enter and abide herein forever. That's it. There's no more worry, no more fear, no more sorrow, no more despair, no more sadness, no more sickness, no more pain. It's just joy and relaxation. Chilling out, maxing our relaxing, shooting some b-ball. Well, Kobe, well, Kobe won't. Inshallah, he turns Muslim. Allahumma ameen. Say ameen. Right? Enjoying paradise. But why am I saying this? Because, brothers and sisters, my topic is connecting to the Creator through the Quran. Right? And there's small things that we can do. A change in perspective. And how we view things, how we approach things, how we view the Quran and interact with the Quran, that can change our lives. The believer whose heart's attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose heart's attached to the akhirah, when he hears assalamu alaikum, what does his heart long for? He longs for hearing the same greeting from the angels of the gates of paradise. The believer when he hears assalamu alaikum, he better than that, he longs for what? Hearing salam from Allah himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call the people of paradise to him. And he will say, when he will appear to them, he will say, Ya Ahl al Jannah, O the, o the people of paradise, Salamun alaykum. Allah Himself will say, Salamun alaykum to the believers. And we will say in response, and we ask Allah to make all of us amongst them, Allahumma ameen. We will say, Allahumma anta salamu minka salam, wa ilayka yarji'u salam. Oh Allah, you are the source of peace, and from you comes peace. But the heart attaches to the Creator just from a simple statement of Assalamu Alaikum. So next time you hear, you see your brother, you see your sister, you say Salam, let out the sigh of longing. Then inshallah I'll hear this statement again from the angels and from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Himself. You see brothers and sisters, we live in a time of confusion and trials and fitan. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in his time, he once woke up in the night and he said, أَيْقِذُوا صَوَاحِبَاتٍ حُجَرٍ Wake up the, the, the companions of these rooms, meaning his wives, wake them up. For tonight has descended fitan, trials that have descended. And he's calling them to pray qiyam al layl to prevent them from falling trap into these trials. Trials, he said, how many are clothed in this world but will be naked on the day of judgment? He said, تُعْرَضُ fitan عَلَى الْقُلُوبِ كَالْحَصِيرِ عُودًا عُودًا He said, the trials will be presented to the hearts like a straw mat, one after another, just in a row, straw after straw after straw, trial upon trial will be presented to the hearts. 
And we live in times like that. Everywhere you go, you're faced with tests and difficulties and trials. Everywhere, you can't open up the internet, you can't turn on the TV or the computer, you can't go shopping to get some ice cream, you can't do anything except that you'll be tested with trials. Trials for the heart. And what gives us strength? In the face of these trials, what gives us strength? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says about the disbelievers in Surah Al-Furqan. They challenged Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, Allah says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّنَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدَةً They said, why hasn't the Qur'an, if it's true, why hasn't it been sent down as one book? Just one time, the revelation is sent down and you have the whole Qur'an. Why are you getting it in pieces and pieces over 23 years? And Allah SWT responds Himself by saying, كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فؤادك. Such is the way it is sent in stages to firm your heart so you have tathbeet, you have, you have a steadfastness in the face of these difficulties. So the Qur'an, brothers and sisters, is the source of steadfastness and benefit. And the title is what? Here or the hereafter? Where will the Qur'an bring us benefit? Here or the hereafter? You know, if I asked you, if I told you that you're going to be entering the Kaaba, you, Allah will honor you to go not just visit the Kaaba and perform Umrah, kiss the black stone, touch the black stone, walk where the Prophet ﷺ walked, but Allah will honor you by allowing you to enter into the Kaaba. If I told you that, what would be your response? How would you, how would you get there? How would you get to that level? What would you do? You know, subhanAllah, there was a, right here in North America, a Quran school that opened up, the students that produced became Hafal. They went to a Nash international Qur'an competition. And the students scored high. So as an honor for them, they had a sponsored trip to Umrah and they got to enter into the Kaaba. Not just visit the Kaaba, they were honored by going into the Kaaba. Students from right here. Just like your Qur'an school and your masjid. But what gave them that position? This Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Inna Allah yarfa' yarfa'u bihad al-kitabi aqwaman wa yad'u bihi akhareen. He ﷺ said that Allah raises nations by virtue of this book. And other, by others, other people are degraded by the same book. Allah can honor you through the Qur'an. And subhanAllah, he says, He says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, he makes a call to all of mankind, he says, Indeed, a, a, a maw'idah has come from your master, your creator. A maw'idah is a, a good reminder, a guide, a, a way for you to follow. Right? Then he says, وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ And a healing for what's in the breasts, what's in the chest. Whatever sorrows you may have. There's a young Egyptian boy who memorized the whole Qur'an while he is blind. He's blind and he memorized the whole Qur'an. Hafid of Qur'an. And they asked him, do you wish you have your eyesight back? And he said, no. If Allah tested you or I with the loss of our vision, we couldn't see anymore, what would be our, our, uh, our wish? We would wish that we could get our eyesight back. That would be our first wish. He's saying, I don't want my eyesight back. I thank Allah for testing me with this test because by virtue of this, inshallah, my rank in the, in the, in the hereafter will be raised. People are depressed, are struggling, are sad, are worried. The Qur'an has the solutions. When you were sad, the Qur'an was right next to you. It's on your phone. You just open up, open up the app and read it and you find solutions to your sadness. You find solutions to your difficulties, to your problems, to your challenges. It's there. وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً And guidance and mercy. Guidance and mercy. لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَارِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Allah SWT then says, Say, O Muhammad SAW, by the bounty of Allah and His mercy. And what is the bounty of Allah and His mercy? Islam and the Qur'an. Allah is saying, by these two things, فَلْيَفْرَحُوا Celebrate, be happy. Be happy that you are a Muslim. You know Musa alayhi salam, the Kaleem of Allah, the one who Allah spoke to by himself directly. He wanted to be in your shoes today. When he was being told about the, the blessings of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he finally said, Allahumma ja'al li min ummatih. O kama qal, O Allah, make me from his Ummah. 
Allah blessed you by being from the greatest nation ever and given the greatest book ever through the greatest angel, through the greatest prophets. He honored you with this kitab, with this Qur'an. It's an honor, it's a, it's, a, it's a nobility for us. Right? It's a nobility for us. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, we have this at our own disposal and a lot of us don't, don't realize. But what I wanted to do, inshallah ta'ala, in the next 15 minutes is share with you some ways in which we can connect our hearts to the Qur'an. Simple changes in our perspective. And our, through the Qur'an, connect our hearts to the Day of Judgment and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when in a, I had a chance to perform Umrah with Ustaz Sam Sharif. I'm feeling thirsty right now. And what happened was we, we decided to, to climb Jabal Thawr. Jabal Thawr is the mountain in which the Prophet ﷺ ascended when he made Hijrah from, from Mecca to Medina. And any of you guys have climbed that mountain before? Show of hands. Anybody? A few? What about Ghar Hira? Where the revelation came down. Anybody? A few more? Okay. Jabal Thawr, if you've been to Ghar Hira, Jabal Thawr is a bigger mountain. And it's more difficult of a climb. And it just so happened that day that I decided to fast. Now our plan was, and it's a long story, I won't get into it. But our plan was to go after Salat al-Fajr, right? When the sun is not out and it's not hot yet. But of course, we did Muslim Standard Time. We showed up there like right, at, right before Salat al-Dhuhr. And so the only people that were there are the people coming down from the mountain. Nobody's going up the mountain. And so we, me, me Sadhvi Sam, and a few other brothers, and we're climbing up the mountain. And like I said, I was fasting that day. And of course, now they have steps made and they have stops along the way where you can get water and stuff like that. You know, I, when I came down from that climb, close to the time for Maghrib, like I was foaming at the mouth, like I was thirsty, like, you know when we was talking about khushu and prayer and looking forward to prayer, I never look forward to a prayer more than that Salat al-Maghrib, right? And I went with my wife to get the iftar, and so, you know, sisters, don't take your husband shopping if they're hungry, right? Because I, I bought like seven different juices, like a kiwi fruit juice, a strawberry banana, mango, they have all these, these flavors, and subhanAllah, when the adhan came and I drank, I drank so much that I didn't eat that night for iftar and I didn't have to eat breakfast the next morning, I was that full. But that's how thirsty I was, just from like a three hour climb underneath the Saudi Arabian sun in the desert. Right, I'm mentioning that because on the Day of Judgment, brothers and sisters, we're going to be what? Standing, not with the sun, whatever, however, you know, million miles away, we're going to be standing with the sun one mile away. One mile away from us. And and the Day of Judgment is 50,000 years long. And everybody will be sweating according to their deeds. And imagine the thirst that you'll feel. Not just the thirst of the Day of Judgment, but imagine the thirst of, of hellfire. Those who are in hellfire, when billah, how thirsty will they feel? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes their thirst when He says Surah Al-Waqi'ah, فَشَارِبُونَ شُرْبَ الْهِيم He says that the drink of the people of hellfire will be boiling water. And He says they will drink the drink of al -heem. You know what a heme is in the Arabic language? It's a camel that's afflicted with a disease that it continues to drink, it constantly feels thirsty. So it continues to drink and drink and drink until it kills itself by drinking so much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the people of hellfire, they will drink like the drink of this camel. Meaning they will, continue, they will feel thirsty, but every time they drink it won't quench their thirst until, until it, will, it, will, it will boil them on the insides. We we'll ask Allah for protection. That's why Hassan ibn Ali, when he was presented with water like this, when he was given a drink of water, he, he began crying. He began crying. They said, why are you crying? And he said, what? He said, I remember the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that about the people of, of hellfire, he says, وَنَادَىٰ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ أَنْ أَفِيضُوا عَلَيْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ The people of hellfire were called out to the people of paradise. Give us some water. Give us some water. O مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ Or whatever Allah has provided for you. And they will say in response, Allah has, has made this forbidden upon the people of hellfire. So why am I saying that? Because anytime you feel thirsty, you can connect your heart to the Akhirah. You see, you read these stories about the Sahaba crying for, for small things that we think is like, what, crying for a drink of water? Right? How, what kind of spiritual level were they at? But it's a simple change in perspective where you're always thinking about Akhirah and thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this can be a spiritual moment in your life. 
This can be a spiritual moment in your life that there may come a day where I'll be prevented from water. So I ask Allah to prevent me from that and to make me strong in this religion and strong until I face Him. You know, when you, you may have gone out yesterday night to get some food, right? Before when the convention was in Connecticut, there wasn't much going on there, right? But now in Baltimore, you got the bay, you got all the stuff going, you got boating, and you have, you know, the, we went to go get some pizza with a bunch of the brothers, and, you know, we just walked by this, just a big, huge party scene. It's a big party scene, right? You may be at college, you may be at your university, and you see people, maybe from your own MSA, or you see others who are indulging in sin. This brother's got a girlfriend, this sister's got a boyfriend. This sister, she took off her hijab, and mashallah, she got married to this guy. Right? So she got noticed, she got married to this guy. You see somebody who's doing things that perhaps shaitan will come to you from the human beings or the shayateen, and they will say to you, they'll whisper to you, why don't you ease up? Why don't you cut back? Why don't you make some compromises? So you can be like them. You can enjoy the enjoyments of this world. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again, you want to connect your heart to the akhirah. Allah describes the situation on the day of judgment in which the people of Jannah will be in Jannah, and the people of Hellfire will be in Hellfire, and between them, there will be this plateau, this, this large area of land. It's called Al-A'raf. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that between the people of Paradise and the people of Hellfire will be the people of A'raf. And who are the people of A'raf? They will be people who, their e bad deeds are equal to their good deeds. And so they haven't entered Hellfire, or they haven't entered Paradise. And so what will happen to them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَيْنَهُمَا حِجَابٌ وَعَلَى الْأَعْرَافِ رِجَالٌ يَعْرِفُونَ كُلًّا بِسِيمَاهُمْ وَنَادَوْا أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ أَنْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ لَمْ يَدْخُلُوهَا وَهُمْ يَطْمَعُونَ They will say what? The people of A'raf who see the people of Jannah and the people of Hellfire, they will call out to the people of Jannah and they will say, Peace be upon you, the same greeting, Salamun Alaikum. And Allah says, Lam yadkhuluha. They haven't entered it yet, but they're hopeful in their hearts. Wahum yatma'un, they're hopeful that they'll be able to enter paradise. Then Allah says, Wa idha surifat absaruhum tilqa'a ashabin nar. قَالُوا رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا مَعَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah SWT says that when they look to the people of hellfire, the same people who perhaps they saw in this world indulging in their desires, and in this world wishing maybe for a second that I wish I could have what they have. They will see these same people and what will they say? They will say, O oh, our Master, O oh, our Lord, I beg you, I beg you, don't make us amongst them. Don't make me amongst these people. So what's the lesson? How do we connect ourselves to the Akhirah? When we see this, when shaitan comes to us and puts these doubts in our heart, let our hearts remember the time when we may be seeing these same kinds of people, but at that moment we'll be begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not make us amongst them. So we will say, now in this world, now in this world we'll say, رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا مَعَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ O oh, our Master, don't make us amongst the wrongdoers. We beg you, O oh Allah, protect me from falling into this trap. Protect me, keep me strong, so I, I, when I meet you, I could be ready to meet you. You know, as you stand up, inshallah ta'ala, after the session to leave, you see a, a hall that's full, and you see two doors in the back. And as you're walking towards the doors and you're leaving, you're going to be in a big crowd. When you're leaving Salat al-Maghrib tonight, inshallah ta'ala, with a jama'ah of 20,000 people praying together, and you're walking out, you're going to be in crowds and crowds, walking through a narrow doorway. And when you're in gatherings like that, when you're in situations like that, when you're at home, when you're at the masjid for Salat al-Jum'ah, and you're waiting to get your shoes, and from the shoe rack, and there's a big line, and you're just waiting in the crowd of believers, again, let your heart long for what? The Prophet ﷺ, he says, he describes the gates of Jannah and he says, وَلَقَدْ ذَكَرَ لَنَا the, uh, Utbah ibn Ghazwan, he says that the Prophet ﷺ said, he says, the, Allah, the Prophet ﷺ described to us that the gates of Jannah between two of its outer portions is the distance of 40 years in travel. 40 years in travel is the distance, distance between, how, that's how wide the gates of Jannah are. But then what does he say? The Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَيَأْتِيَنَّ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمٌ وَهُوَ كَذِيظٌ مِّنَ الزِّحَامِ 
He says, there will come upon these gates as wide as they are, 40 years of travel. There will be a, come upon a, 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 the gates these day, a, on this day that it will be so crowded, it will be overcrowded that people won't find a way in, meaning they have to wait. There's just crowds around the gates of paradise. So every time you're in a crowd like this, when you're walking out today, as you're walking around the convention, when you're at home, when you go to Hajj and you're around believers, every time you're in a group and you're walking in crowds, let your heart long for what? The moment you'll be crowding around the gates of paradise. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we leave the gathering here that the angels will say to us, lakum, qad buddilat hasanat. As the hadith says, when you stand up and leave the gatherings remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of your sins have been forgiven and not just that, your bad deeds have been turned into good deeds. Allahumma ameen. And I had more to say in terms of the ways we can connect our heart to the Qur'an but for the sake of time I want to give you some concluding remarks. You know, the Qur'an is remarkable. And that so many different scenarios, you'll find, you'll find abilities to co connect your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you see the rain descending and you see Allah bringing earth to the, to the grass, life to the earth again. You see the grass growing again and the trees blooming and the flowers and their beautiful magnificent colors. Why does Surah, Al -Qa surah Qaf, the surah about the day of judgment, why is the whole first page about the rain that Allah sends down? Because the rain brings life to the dead earth and Allah will bring life to the dead individuals. Bring them back to life again. So when you see the seasons and you see the rain and you see the, the vegetation coming back, think about the day Allah will bring back life from the dead. When you make wudu, every time you make wudu, think about the day when the Prophet ﷺ will recognize his, the believers by the nur, the lights that's on their limbs from when they made wudu from this world. Right? When you... When you uh, when you visit the sick, think about when Allah will ask you on the Day of Judgment, I, you know, I, w I was sick, why didn't you visit me? And they will say, oh Allah, how can we visit you when you were the Lord of the worlds? Didn't you know so and so was sick? If you visited him, you would have found me there with him. Right? Think about these things that you connect your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Almost everyone, everybody here has one time or another been burned by something hot. Maybe you touched the stove or your biryani was too hot or, the, or the, the plate that you take out from the microwave, it's hot. And you feel this and you, pull, you draw back. Think then, if I can't hold patience in this, how can I hold patience on the Day of Judgment? Right? Connect your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Qur'an. And to do this, you have to develop a relationship with the Qur'an. We have to have, the Qur'an has to be our best friend. The Qur'an has to be our best friend. You recite it, you read it, or you reflect upon it, you memorize it. And when you memorize it, don't think you're doing Allah a favor. When Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he was told, Inna fulana yahfad al-Qur'an, that this person is memorizing the Qur'an, he said, no, bal Allah yahfadu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is memorize, uh, preserving him through the Qur'an. He is not preserving the Qur'an when you memorize the Qur'an. Allah is preserving you through the Qur'an. It's an honor to carry the Qur'an. It's an honor to be one who is the carriers of the Qur'an. Right? So, but we have to have this relationship with the Qur'an, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it's your best friend, brothers and sisters, when the Qur'an is your best friend, your life changes. You go from being a person who just sees things as, as they are, to seeing, to seeing things with, the, with like glasses whose tints are the tints of Qur'an. You see things through the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things aren't how they normally appear, but you see them through a Qur'anic vision. You know, and it's remarkable when you have a heart that's full of the Qur'an and it's alive with the Qur'an, right? On the Day of Judgment, the Prophet Sallallahu he says, he says, يَأْتِ الْقُرْآنِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ تَقْتُمُهُ الزَّهْرَاوَانِ الْبَقَرَةُ وَآلُ عِمْرَانِ تُحَادْ جَانِ عَنْ صَاحِبِهِمَا He says on the Day of Judgment, when no prophet will even be able to go forward and speak in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No angel who is close to Allah will be able to go forth and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَخَشَعَتِ الْأَصْوَاتُ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ When all the voices will be humble to Ar-Rahman, the Qur'an will come forward and it will testify. It will not just testify, it will like argue on your behalf. On behalf of the one who was its companion in this world. The Qur'an will come, will be a guide for you on the Day of Judgment, just as it was a guide for you in this world. And if you don't have that relationship with the Qur'an, the Qur'an will come for those who are the people of the Qur'an, it will testify for Allah, in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. What about if you, didn't, weren't, you weren't from the people of Qur'an? What would happen? 
the Prophet of Allah himself وسلم, will be complaining about these people. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The Prophet himself will complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Oh my master, my people, my nation, who I stood for day and night, I, he, he cried for us when we don't even cry for ourselves. He wished to see us, he wished to meet us. He's sitting with his companions and he's saying, وَذِدْتُ أَنَّا قَدْ رَأَيْنَا إِخْوَانَنَا I wish from the bottom of my heart that I could see my brothers and my sisters. And they said, أَوَلَسْنَا إِخْوَانَكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Are we not your brothers and sisters? And he said, no, you're my companions. My brothers and sisters are those who come after me. They believe in me, but they've never seen me. The Prophet wanted to see you. He loved you more than you, you love your own self. He loves you more than your parents love you. And he is going to complain about a certain group of people on Day of Judgment. Who? The people who abandoned the Qur'an. The people who abandoned the Qur'an, they fled from the Qur'an. So brothers and sisters, we have to build this relationship with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of you heard of Baraka radiallahu anha? Baraka radiallahu anha was an Abyssinian slave. A black woman from Abyssinia who was a slave of Abdullah. Abdullah who? Abu Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was a slave of the father of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know that Amina, the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was pregnant with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Abdullah died. The father of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died while his wife was pregnant. And so Baraka became now was the servant of Amina, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ. And she would serve her and take care of her, and they formed this very close relationship. You know, when Amina found out the news that her husband passed away, she fainted. She fainted in distress, and she became very sick. And it was Baraka radiallahu anha wa who was consoling and comforting and nursing the mother of Muhammad ﷺ. And one time Amina wanted to go to Medina, she was from Medina, originally from Yathrib which is present-day Medina. And her husband had died on a tra trip to, to Syria, a little north of Medina. And so she wanted to go visit her family. And so she went with Barakah and with Muhammad Wasallam. And when they went to visit the family, she went to visit where her, her husband had passed away and was buried. On their way back, she became ill. She became sick. And so she called Barakah close to her. And she whispered in Baraka's ears. And she said that, I feel that the sickness that I have right now is going to take my life. So she says, she says, so take care of Muhammad, her son Muhammad, who was six years old at the time, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Take care of Muhammad. He lost his father, father before he was even born. And he is now going to lose his mother. So, oh Baraka, be a mother to him. Baraka, brothers and sisters, you know who she was? She was the first person in the world, the first person ever to hold Muhammad Sallallahu when he was born. She was there at the delivery and was the first person to hold Muhammad Sallallahu when he came out of his mother's womb. And now Amina is telling Baraka, oh Baraka, be to him a mother because I am going to pass away. And so after Amina passed away, Barakah stayed with the Prophet ﷺ all the way until he got married. She stayed in his household and took care of him and helped raise him. And after he got married, the Prophet ﷺ set her free and encouraged her to get married and got her married to someone from Medina. And so he, she married some Ubaid from Medina, they moved to Medina, he passed away and she, she came back and lived in the house of the Prophet ﷺ with Khadija. Again, being with the Messenger of Allah. She, the Prophet ﷺ would go to her and say, Ummi, Ya Ummi, Kayfa Ajiduki, Oh my mother, how do I find you? He called her my mother. Her name was, her other name was Umm Ayman radiallahu anha. Umm Ayman was the mother of Usama ibn Zayd. Usama ibn Zayd was one of the greatest companions of the Messenger of Allah, who the Messenger of Allah loved deeply. But Umm Ayman was called by the Messenger of Allah وسلم, himself, Ummi, my mother. And why am I saying that? Because the Messenger of Allah, he even once said to the companions, whoever would like to marry a woman from the woman of paradise, 
I have someone for you. And it was Umm Ayman. He gave her glad tidings of paradise in this world. So if there's anyone, brothers and sisters, if there's anyone who was attached to the Messenger of Allah, it was Umm Ayman. There is nobody in the seerah, there is nobody who knew the Prophet ﷺ from birth to death. Nobody except for Umm Ayman. She was the first to hold him and she outlived him. And when the Prophet ﷺ died, when Medina was in a state of chaos, when Amr al-Khattab stood up in front of the people with his sword and he said, whoever said Muhammad has died, فَسَوْفَ أَقْتُلْهُ بِسَيْفِ هَذَا مُحَمَّدٌ مَا مَات مُحَمَّدٌ مَا مَات مُحَمَّدٌ لَنْ يَمُوتْ he couldn't understand, he couldn't fathom that the Prophet ﷺ died. He said, whoever says Muhammad ﷺ has died, I'm going to kill him with this sword. He hasn't died and he'll never die. Right when Uthman, he, he, couldn't, even, he couldn't even speak. Anhu. Ali Nabi Talib, he sat in, the, in, 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 in his home, he, nobody knew what to do. Right in the famous statement, Abu Bakr brought the people back. And the, you know how, how depressed the city in Medina was? There is no greater trial than the trial of the death of Muhammad ﷺ. And after the people's hearts were being consoled and the, 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 ire, the eyes calmed down and the tears dried up, Abu Bakr and Umar, they went to go visit Umm Ayman. And they found Umm Ayman crying. They found Umm Ayman crying. And they said, Ya Umm Ayman, ma yubkik? Oh Umm Ayman, what's causing you to cry? Don't you know that the Prophet ﷺ, what he has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better? He's with Allah. He's in Jannah. Bal al-Rafiq al-A'la. He's with the highest companion. And she says, yes, I know. I know that the Prophet has better with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the, we, the reason why I'm crying? Walakin abki ala inqita' al-wahi min as The reason why I'm crying is because Qur'an, the revelation, is no longer coming down. That was her, that was her depth of love for the Qur'an. The one who was like a mother to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi So brothers and sisters, my challenge to you is this, is to spend 10 minutes a day. That's all I'm asking, of not just reciting. Don't read the Qur'an and you're, you're looking at the bookmark, when am I finishing the surah, when am I going to get done? Rather, my challenge to you is to read 10 minutes a day and reflect on the ayah. Read the meaning and read, read the ayah and read the translation. And see how it will move you. See how it will change your life. Because one verse will change your life, just like it changed the life of Amr al-Khattab and all the others. So brothers and sisters, I end with this. If you want to know your status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to notice, know where is your rank with Allah, then look no further than where is the rank of Allah and the, 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 the rank and the status of the words of Allah in your life.